So maybe building on this, this connects to my philosophical question yeah. I wanted to yeah. ask. That what comes after identity? I mean, everybody today, all the culture of politically correctness, but so much of politics is this obsession with identity. And basically, we all know the answer already. Everybody knows, at least everybody who, who really thinks knows, that all identities are fictions. All ad identities yeah. are our historical constructions. We've been through it so many times, we know it. And w we still go through this, the ritual of exposing it again and again, but this is a done deal. And what really in fascinates me, again, from a philosophical and mm, historical mm. perspective, is what comes now? How does the world look like after people accept that, yes, all identities are fictions? So what's the next stage? If you agree that it's now a done deal, yeah. that everybody knows that all identities are fictions. I will give you a very strange answer. Uh, 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 you have to accept that it's a fiction, mm -hmm. and you have to take this fiction absolutely 100% seriously. I will give you... A let me <laughs> use a wonderful example. I have a great problems with Hannah Arendt, mm -hmm. uh, uh, although it's very interesting what she wrote, Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, but, but in one text, was it on education or whatever, she gives a wonderful, <laughs> she develops a wonderful thought. She says that, let's say you are a broken down parent, and you have, uh, or parents, and you have a young child. And the child is totally confused and says, Father, I like now, Father, I'm afraid of the world. What will happen? How should we act? She said, the truth would have been to say, listen, I'm also in deep shit. I don't know. I am lost. But this wouldn't be ethically the correct thing. Hmm. To deprive in this sense, you should find a middle way Something like to say, yes, it's a lost situation, but nonetheless, you can count on me. Mm. Not lying, not I can save you, you know. But uh, this brings me to a crucial point. To say the truth, literal truth, can be a lie also mm. in certain intersubjective constellations. Yes. My source is here, I always quote it, one of my favorite passages from Jacques Lacan, where he says, it's a male chauvinist example, I would prefer to turn it around, but nonetheless. Let's say I'm married, I have a wife, and I'm jealous that she's sleeping around with other men all the time. And Lacan says something beautiful. He says, even if all my suspicions are true, mm -hmm. she really is doing it, my jealousy is still a pathological thing. Because the point of my jealousy is not, is it true or not? But why do I need this fixation of jealousy to assert my identity? That's why, now comes the more problematic part, I'm coming to you as a Jew. Mm -hmm. I think, not in the sense that Nazis were right, but the same goes for anti-Semitism. Let's say we are in Germany. Uh, you like Jews, I don't like them, all is a fiction. But we debate in 37, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you claim, but nonetheless some of, I claim, some, nonetheless some of the things that Nazis are claiming about Jews are true. You deny it. Mm -hmm. Let's look at objective facts. Some of the things were true. It's true that 60% of uh, art critics in Berlin were Jews. Mm -hmm. that Jews were seducing uh, uh, German girls. Well, I hope they did, and <laughs> vice versa, you know. Jews were rich. Yes, some of them were. Not so if you even accept at this level the debate, mm -hmm. we should also clarify this. It's not to say it doesn't matter, but you have already sold your soul to the devil because the result will be this type of, yeah, maybe Nazis exaggerate a little bit, but nonetheless, the truth is in the middle. No, the truth is not in the middle because irrespective of fact, Nazi anti-Semitism was a fake in its subjective function. The point was to project onto the Jew 
external intruder, we know the Marxist story. Mm -hmm. uh, the cause of antagonism to deny that society needs to have antagonistic and so on and so on. So, uh, so uh, uh, this for me is, is the insight here. And I also approach in this way your emphasis on stories we are telling and so on and so on. This is the lesson that I get from Marxism still from psychoanalysis and so on. Not only every ethical engagement, but even every general view of society cannot ever be neutral. Not in the relativist sense, everything is relative, blah, blah. No, the paradox of Marxism, I would use it in different way today, is that to be in a proletarian position means you have a partial experience. But there is universal truth in this experience. In the sense that, for example, if you want to talk about racism in Germany in the late 30s, of course, Jews are only one of the examples. But it's an obscenity not to mention anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is, or even absolute sympathy, solidarity with the Jews. It's the only way to arrive at an objective truth. Mm -hmm. It's not simply, there is no, ob like objective truth itself is not really a neutral category. It's as Frankfurt School Marxist showed up nicely, so-called objective neutral gaze formally always works for those in power the way it relates to its, uh, to its object. Mm -hmm. So here, my point would have been, to translate your terms, uh, not just facts, but story. And I would even add this. The most dangerous racist and so on propaganda is when you have a false presupposition, narrative, mm -hmm. anti-Semitic, and you sustain it with actual facts. So that, because, again, if you pay me, but I would never do it, I would rather kill myself, I would easily write a book on excessive Jewish influence in Germany in early 30s. Every fact would have been true there. And nonetheless, it would have been a dirty, anti-Semitic uh, book. No? 